Good morning. We are Rick and Neely Barnhart. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. Good morning, FPC family. Welcome to Sunday Worship. We're so glad you're here. Good morning, everybody. I'm Walker Beck. And I'm Andrew Beck. We are members of the youth group here at First Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you can join us this morning, and it's a real joy to welcome you to worship. The psalmist reminds us that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and God's compassion is over all that God has made. Welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church in Richmond, Virginia. My name is Amy Star Redwine. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. During these past few months, as all of our lives have changed dramatically during this pandemic, we as a church have lived out our belief that we are the church wherever we are. We are continuing to find innovative and creative ways to fulfill our mission, to inspire people to faith in Jesus Christ, nurture disciples of Christ, and serve the world God so loves to the glory of God. And we are finding ways to stay true to our values, to be grounded, growing, and generous disciples of Jesus. Every day, I get to see evidence of how you are doing all of these things. And I wanna thank you for your persistent faith, hope, and love. If you are looking for ways to engage with the church, please take a look at our website, fpcrichmond.org, which is regularly updated with opportunities for learning and service, as well as with announcements about things that are happening in our community. And if you are visiting with us today, we are so glad that you are here and we invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself by using our virtual contact card, which you can find at fpcrichmond.org slash contact card. I also want to invite all of you to participate in an opportunity that's coming up and the deadline is right around the corner, but we are trying to do a virtual hymn sing with our congregation in this time where we can't sing hymns together in person. We've chosen a wonderful hymn from our hymnal, a hymn called For Everyone Born, and we're inviting you and your family to sing, take a little video of yourself singing a verse or the refrain, as much or as little as you want, and we will put it all together and share it on September 13th. To learn more and to figure out how to do all of this, visit fpcrichmond.org slash sing. And thank you for your participation. It is a joy for us to gather together in worship, for worship is where we remember that we belong to God and that God holds each one of us and this whole world in God's loving and merciful hands. So with joy and thanksgiving, let us worship God. Yeah. 
It was once said that God gives, God gives, and God forgives. And we get, and we get, and we forget. With humility in our hearts, acknowledging the ways in which we have turned from one another and from God's calling in our lives, let us confess together. O oh God of deep and abiding love, you have called to us yet again in the cries of those hurt by violence in the silent tears of a grieving spouse, in the soil turned over by protesting feet, reminding us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Despite our best efforts to turn toward our neighbor in love, we reject the uncomfortable, we retreat to complacency, and turn away from you. In humility, forgive us. Break open our hearts with compassion for all humanity, directing our vision and mission to restoring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Guided by love, help us to see your image in all creation. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. In John's gospel, Jesus reminds his followers of the new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Trusting in this great love, may we strive to reconcile our lives to the calling of our Lord. By grace, we are forgiven in Christ. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen world without end Amen Amen. Having received the peace that comes with Christ's forgiveness, we now have the opportunity to share that peace with one another, whether with the people you are worshiping with in person today or with someone who's not with you, but with whom you would like to share Christ's peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Hello to our youngest disciples. I am so excited to bring you a very special edition of Some Good News FPC edition. Today, I have some special guests to help me share some good news, and I can't wait to bring them in on the action. First, I know that many of us learned in Compassion Camp that one of the many ways we can show compassion to others is by helping those who need some extra help. 
Well, we as a church decided to do that in a special way during the pandemic. We've done some research to find out which local organizations are working especially hard to help people who have needed extra food or housing or care during this time. And we decided to support them by giving them grants. And grants are just money that helps them do their work. This week, we are giving two $20,000 grants to an organization called Feed More, which helps feed hungry people, and one called ACTS, which helps people who need a little extra help paying their bills. Earlier this summer, we gave three other grants to The Daily Planet, which provides free healthcare, Homeward, an organization that helps people find housing, and Caritas, which also provides housing and care for those in need. As a church community, we have given away a total of $100,000 in what we are calling COVID-19 relief grants. And that is a wonderful way we are sharing the good news of God's love. In this time, we also have a group of people in our church called our Community Partner Grants Committee, and they have been working hard to figure out what are some other organizations in Richmond we can partner with to share God's love. This is what our special correspondents are going to tell us about today. These special guests are people you already know and love, my colleagues Janet Legro and Wilson Kennedy. They are out in the city ready to share some good news with us about these new community partners. Janet, over to you. Thanks, Amy. There sure are a lot of organizations carrying good news and good works to the city of Richmond. I'm here just outside of Richmond Hill. Richmond Hill is home base for the Armstrong Leadership Program, which offers friendship, mentoring, and leadership training for high school students at Armstrong High School. ALP is one of our five community partners that have received a three-year grant based on the amazing work they're doing in our community. Our community partner grants are such a meaningful way for us to deepen relationships with our city. And we're so grateful to the Community Grants Committee for all their hard work establishing these grants and to all of you at FPC for helping make this generosity possible. I'm gonna hand it over now to Wilson Kennedy another of our correspondents who will introduce you to one of our oldest partners who is in a brand new building. Over to you, Wilson. Thanks, Janet. I'm here at the brand new Henry Marsh Elementary School, previously George Mason Elementary School. This school has been one of our most important partners for over 19 years. Thanks to the, many hard, the hard work of many volunteers, we are committed to the children, parents, and teachers of Henry Marsh School, and we are eager to see children streaming into this beautiful building. And before I go, I just want to mention the four other recipients of our community partner grants. Boaz and Ruth, Crossover Healthcare Ministries, The Healing Place at Caritas, and the STEP program in the Gilpin Court community. These five organizations, along with Henry Marsh Elementary, are changing lives in the city of Richmond. Congratulations to all our community partners. Such good news. And stay tuned because we will be exploring all kinds of ways to learn from our partners and work together in the coming weeks and months. And we'd love for you all to share in this good news. If you would like to learn more or be more involved in one of these areas, please get in touch. I would love to hear from you. Back to you, Amy. Thank you, Wilson and Janet. That certainly is some good news. And now for some really exciting and special good news, I want to introduce you to one of the newest members of our FPC family. And no, it's not a new baby. We'll have some good news about babies next time. It is our new Minister of Music and Arts, Jason N. Brown. Jason is coming to us today from South Carolina, but soon he will be moving to Richmond to start his work with us. 
Jason, welcome. I am so glad you can join us today, and I'm so excited to share the good news of your arrival with our church family. Good morning. It's great to be with you, and uh, thanks for having me on today. Oh, it's so great to have you with us. And um, by means of introduction, I just invite you to answer a couple of questions that I have for you. We know that you have got um, so much musical talent and uh, you're a singer and a conductor and you also play the piano and organ. Um, you've sung a lot of opera. And I would love for you just to share with us why church music is your calling. Well, um, my grandfather was a pastor, and I have uh, two uncles who are pastors as well. Um, so I grew up uh, going to church every time the doors were open. And uh, I actually started playing at church when I was seven years old. Uh, so even though I took some detours into opera and, um, and classical music in general, um, doing church music has always been a passion of mine. and. Um, I'm lucky to be able to do it for a living because I get to do two things that I, I really enjoy doing. I get to praise God and make music um, and, and lead congregations in doing that. Well, that is wonderful to be able to find a way to do both of those things that you love. Tell us what you're excited about uh, in terms of coming to Richmond and First Presbyterian. Well, I'm excited about coming to Richmond in part because I visited once when I was in college on a choir tour and I thought it was just a beautiful uh, place. So it'll be exciting to get to know Richmond just a little bit better. Um, but I'm excited about First Presbyterian Church because between the young families and the particular ministries that the church is engaged with, I think it's just going to be a wonderful place to be engaged in ministry. Well, we certainly think so, and we're so excited for you to join us here in our ministry. Jason, what's one thing that you would like us to know about you or that you want to share with us today? Well, one fun fact is <laughs> this, 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 this may not be the best thing to share with children, but I actually became a musician because I didn't want to be a Boy Scout. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My mother had a rule that we all had to do something other than go to school. And uh, my older brother was already a Boy Scout, so she figured, oh, I'll just have Jason be a Boy Scout too. And um, I, I, I didn't particularly care for standing in the sun, tying knots and all of that. So um, one day on my way to school, I saw a sign outside of somebody's house saying music lessons here. And I was like, "That that's the other thing I'll do. So <laughs> that is why oh, I'm that's a musician great. today. <laughs> that's a great story, Jason. And I'm sure some of our young disciples and maybe some of our older disciples can relate to that. Um, so thank you for sharing. Well, it is so great to get the chance to chat with you and um, have you begin to meet some of our church family. And I know that we are all looking forward to welcoming you here with us. And I hope we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Thanks again for having me. Bye. Bye bye. Well, isn't that some amazing news? I know that we are all excited to welcome Jason here and look forward to the chance when we can do that in person. But of course, we'll find ways to do it virtually in the meantime. Thanks for joining me today for some good news. And remember, every day, every moment, we can find ways to share the good news of God's love with everyone we meet. Till next time.
unrevealed until it sees her, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death the resurrection, at the last the victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before I read today's scripture lesson, I'm going to offer some context. Many of us are familiar with the story we often call Jonah and the whale. In this story, a prophet named Jonah receives directions from the Lord to go to a city called Nineveh and preach to the people there to call them to account for their sinful behavior. But instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah runs away. He gets on a boat heading in the opposite direction. It turns out, though, escaping God's call is not so easy. And as the story goes, Jonah gets thrown overboard and swallowed up by a big fish. Basically, he gets thrown into divine time out. And amazingly, it works. After three days in the belly of the whale, Jonah repents and prays, and the fish vomits him onto dry land. This time, Jonah does what God says when God sends him to Nineveh again. Jonah stomps his way across Nineveh, preaching the shortest sermon ever. Forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. What's really shocking is that it's one of the most effective sermons ever. The people of Nineveh repent. They turn away from their sinful ways. God has mercy on them and decides not to destroy the city after all. All's well that ends well, right? Except that's not the end of the story. Because even though we usually turn Jonah's story into a cautionary tale about what happens when we try to run away from God's call, what happens at the end suggests that this story has another important lesson to teach us. Hear now this reading of Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 through chapter 4, verse 11. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. 
When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a psychological study a few years ago, pairs of college students were recruited to play a game of Monopoly, but the game was rigged. With the flip of a coin, one of the two players in each game was assigned to be the rich player. This player got more money up front than the other player and received more money every time he went around the board. Now, most of the pairs figured out what was happening, and as you would expect, the rich player nearly always won the game. What you might not have expected is how this experience influenced the attitude and thoughts of the rich player in each pair. As they played, the rich players quickly began to exhibit increasingly dominant and assertive behavior, striking their pieces loudly against the board as they moved, displaying power over the poor player verbally and non-verbally, even taking more from the bowl of common snacks. The rich players also behaved more rudely toward the poor players and were less sensitive to the poor player's experience and frustration and became more demonstrative of their own wealth and success, virtual though it was. When the game ended, the scientists interviewed each player about their experiences playing this rigged game. And at this point, everyone knew the game had been rigged. And yet, when they asked the rich players why they won, the players talked about decisions they had made, properties they had bought, strategies through which they had earned their success, completely discounting the fact that their success had been predetermined by a roll of dice before the game ever started. Jonah was a Hebrew one of God's chosen people. And if God chose Jonah to be a prophet, presumably it was because Jonah had shown himself to be faithful, earnest in his desire to follow God's ways. But Jonah's faithfulness has its limits. And Jonah discovers what those limits are when God tells him to go to the city of Nineveh and tell the people there of God's love and mercy. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. And it turns out there's a really good reason why he doesn't want to go and preach to these particular people. Nineveh was the capital of the ruthless Assyrian Empire, an empire that had repeatedly terrorized the Israelites. The people of Nineveh, in other words, were the Israelites' sworn enemies. So it's no wonder Jonah balked when God told him to go and preach to them of God's love and mercy in hopes that they will repent. For as Jonah knows, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. And Jonah isn't sure he wants to see Nineveh on the receiving end 
of God's grace. When I lived in Colorado years ago, a friend convinced me to participate in a sprint triathlon. For months, we trained together for the race, and when the big day came, I felt prepared. Swimming was my strongest event, and I got out of the water after the swim portion feeling good. I hopped on my bike and headed out. The bike ride in this race wasn't very interesting. Seven and a half miles out the highway in one direction and then seven and a half miles back. But when I got out onto the road, I couldn't believe how good I felt. Not just strong, but fast. Clearly, all the training had paid off. Now, I was a little surprised because really, I'm not that athletic and didn't have a lot of experience with racing my bike, but I owned this race. Before I knew it, it was time to turn around and come back the other way. Only then did I realize that what I thought was hard work and maybe some natural ability was in fact a very strong wind that had been at my back and was now fighting me mightily in the other direction. What happens to Jonah at the end of his book when the plant giving him shade withers and he feels the effects of the sun and the hot wind? It's a perfect example of someone fighting against the current of God's mercy and grace. Jonah is convinced that the Ninevites should never get to be on the receiving end of God's mercy, and he is equally convinced that he deserves whatever blessings God offers him. Jonah is caught in this cycle of judgment and condemnation, and he is struggling to extend to his enemies the same grace God has offered to him. It's a pattern of judgment we all get caught in from time to time. We judge ourselves worthy or unworthy in spite of evidence to the contrary. We judge others, too, by their appearance, their achievements or lack thereof, often failing to see the many factors that contribute to their success or failure. We become trapped in a cycle of judgment, unable to extend compassion, empathy, or love. There is a story in the Gospel of John. Jesus is teaching in the temple when a group of religious leaders bring a disgraced woman before him to test his knowledge of the law and his willingness to enforce it. These men are buoyed up by the currents of culture and privilege. After all, if the woman they brought was indeed caught in the act of adultery, as they claim, then somewhere there was also a man caught in the act as well. But Jesus refuses to get drawn into a discussion about law, and he refuses to condemn the woman. Here and throughout his ministry, Jesus keeps trying to teach us the same thing God tried to teach Jonah, that God is not transactional. God is not obsessed with right and wrong, guilt and punishment, success and rewards. God is obsessed with loving us just as we are because God is relentlessly relational. Time and again, particularly with those on the margins who have spent their lives fighting invisible currents of prejudice, Jesus sets aside judgment and shows us what it looks like to choose compassion. Father Gregory Boyle once said, The measure of our compassion lies in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with each other, with the folks who are on the margins. For there is an idea that has taken root in the world that there just might be lives out there 
that matter less than other lives. To move past this idea that some lives matter more than others, Boyle suggests service. When we serve another, he says, we move toward experiencing the kind of compassion that can stand in awe of what another person has to carry, rather than standing in judgment of how they carry it. Service frees us for compassion because it puts us in relationship with those we are more likely to judge, enabling us to, as the poet Wendell Berry puts it, imagine lives that aren't ours. When Jonah finally goes to Nineveh, after his time in the belly of the whale, he simply walks a straight line through the city, preaches his seven-word sermon, and then leaves. He does not stop to learn anything about who the Ninevites are. He interacts not at all with the people who live in that city. And as a result, he has no capacity to imagine their lives or empathize with their challenges. That is not service. That is not relationship. And so Jonah remains trapped in his ignorance and judgment. At the 2016 Oscars, Lady Gaga performed the song, Till It Happens to You, from a documentary about sexual assault on college campuses. The lyrics are, till it happens to you, you don't know how I feel. Till it happens to you, you won't know. It won't be real. On the one hand, the song is exactly right. How can we ever truly know the nature of another person's experience, especially if it is a horrific, traumatic experience we haven't had? On the other hand, in order to faithfully follow a relentlessly relational God, we are going to have to find ways to feel and show compassion for people whose experience is not our own, for people we will never fully understand. Compassion comes when we set aside judgment and focus on what we all have in common, our God-given identity as beloved children of God, who have discovered in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we are beloved, not because of who we are or what we have done, but simply because we belong to God and God chooses love. God chooses to love even Jonah in his petulant anger. God chooses to love even the religious authorities with their unjust accusations. God chooses to love even the Ninevites who persistently violated God's ways. God chooses to love even us, even when our ignorance and our rush to judgment prevents us from showing love and compassion to those who need it most. It is God's love, love most fully revealed in the incarnation when God decided to put God's own self into our human experience. It is in that love that the soul finds its worth. It is not our actions or our piety that confers worth or value. It is the fact that God created us. God calls us God's own. God loves us no matter what. Enough to be with us as one of us without judgment or condition. In a letter to Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton once wrote, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. And in fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do 
is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy, if anything can. God is calling us to Nineveh, to that place and those people. We cannot imagine are worthy of God's love or our time. God is calling us to love others with the kind of love that does not stop to ask whether they are deserving of it. We can run from that call or outright refuse it or even just resent it. But imagine what might happen if we dared to accept it. Amen. Good morning. It is this time in our worship where we come together for a time of prayer. Our prayer list has been presented for us today. Let us now come before our God who is listening and offer the prayers on our hearts and mind this day. Let us pray. Holy One, we have gathered here this morning with all of who we are with all of who we are not, with all of who we hope to be. We pray we would be changed by our worship this morning. We pray for an opening in our hearts and minds, recognizing you as the God of relationships, not transactions. Remembering that Jesus invites us not to push harder but to come to him with our burdens and receive his rest. Lord God, heal us in our broken places, move us out of our fear 
into the strength you offer us moment by moment. Hear our prayers this day as we take a moment to offer them before your throne of grace. We offer our prayers for all the brokenness we bear witness to. We pray for students beginning school, parents and caregivers figuring out how to do things differently. We pray for the most vulnerable among us who are impacted by the changes the pandemic is bringing. We pray for healthcare workers, for teachers, and all service workers. We pray for your peace, O Christ, in a season where there is much uncertainty. We offer the prayers we don't even know to pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, for your church, and in particular, our church at First Presbyterian Richmond. Together, we long to have our faith deepened, to serve you in all of our life, and to trust just a little bit more this day, to trust that we belong to you. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And now together we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, we are so grateful that you are worshiping with us today. This is the time during an in-person service that we would remind you to sign the friendship pad. I look forward to the day when we can do that again. But for now, please let us know that you're with us. If you're watching on Sunday morning, we'd love for you to say hello in the YouTube chat. Sometimes we watch the service on our TV and I'll pull up the chat on my phone. Or you can leave a comment here or on our Facebook page, even if you're worshiping later. And if you're visiting, please go to fpcrichmond.org slash contact card to connect with us. A couple of quick announcements. Remember to take advantage of the wonderful offering that we have with Journey Kitchen as they provide delicious meals ready to be picked up and eaten on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Try it out if you haven't yet. Our family loves them. You can check out the menu and order your meals before noon today at the link below. There is also a place to make a donation to our COVID response if you would like. Friends, God chooses mercy over judgment. Mercy. What does that look like in your life today? God's mercy is being extended through the community partner relationships that we have at our church. Wilson and Janet, our special SGN correspondent, shared with you some of the powerful ways that we are supporting our community partners. We are able to share Christ's love with one another in these very tangible ways because of the gifts that you give to the church. Thank you for your generosity. It is at this time in our worship where we are invited to return a portion of what we have been given back to the Lord. And we do this through our offering. You can give online through the link below or send in a check or make a drop off through the secure mailbox at the church. Thank you for all the ways that you give.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, remembering that God loves you and all those you love and all those you struggle to love and all those no one loves with astonishing mercy and kindness and compassion. And God invites us to do the same. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ surround you and uphold you. May the love of God fill you and empower you. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bind us all together, whoever and wherever we are. Amen.